All right, everybody, welcome back to Swage Lock Southeast Texas Talks. I'm your host, Buster Caballera, and as you can see, my cohort for this week, Logan Bodright, he's back in the studios. Logan, welcome back. How's it going, man? Oh, it's going good. Happy to be back here. Uh, so today we've got Steve Wilborg on the show. And Steve Wilborg is our Swage Lock, Swage Lock Certified Trainer and Training Manager. And he's going to be here talking about all things training, everything that we can do, and, and answering some of the questions that we have. So uh, let's get right into it. Hey, Steve. Thanks for joining us, man. How you doing? Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Good. Hey, well, Steve, you you have been with Swagelock a very long time. God, the things that we could probably say that you have done for us, we're just going to let you do it. Give it. Give us your superhero origin story, your your background with Swagelock. Yeah, well, I started uh, in 1987, now 33 years ago, uh, when you and Logan were learning to walk, I guess. I was six. I was trying to color in the lines. <laughs> I was in diapers, so yeah. Yeah, so, but uh, different time, that was before PCs, before cell phones, and we didn't even have pagers. But oddly enough, uh, I really think it was easier to get access to people back then. So, but it was, it was a great experience uh, going to work for Swainsock because they did such a good job of preparing us with a formal training uh, program and a lot of help. There was uh, a very experienced staff there at the time. It still is, but at the time, uh, for sure, with uh, tons of experience, cumulative experience, uh, working in industry, working with Swedesock. And so I had a lot of mentors and uh, very thankful for that. And probably had Gary as one of your mentors, right? Yes, he was. Yes, he was, he was, he was there in the beginning. Oh, God, that's crazy. So... Well, Steve, what, what does your role look like today? Like, what, what exactly do you do as training manager for Switch Lock Southeast Texas? Yeah, well, I have a dual role. So I still support customers uh, as, you know, as a technical advisor like, uh, like you and Buster do uh, day to day. But the job that takes up the majority of my, uh, my bandwidth is, uh, is the training manager role. And so that is uh, uh, customer facing training. It's uh, providing technical training to the people that use our products across across southeast texas awesome awesome well hey we'll get into to some of the questions a little bit here um since you've been around since 1987 i was uh probably walking then but just barely um what did what did training look like back in the in the 90s late 80s early 90s like what, what yeah. did you and, and before that, also, uh, if somebody asked for training, we would uh, come out and, and do what we called at the time a safety seminar. And uh, it might last 30 or 45 minutes. And it was uh, basically a lunch and learn where you have a you know, product demonstration followed by some, uh, some do's and don'ts. So... Steve, how has that approach changed to, you know, what we're doing now currently? Yeah, well, it's totally different now, Buster, because we're actually training people uh, now. Uh, uh, we uh, realized, and, and, and more importantly, the industry realized, our customers realized that the, the lunch and learns were, there was some good information in there, but it really wasn't uh, accomplishing the objectives that, that everybody uh, needed. To happen, so uh, the approach we we took was we, we started with what goes wrong with fluid systems, and there was you know over seventy years of global swage lock experience to draw from, and uh, uh, what we found and, and what we know is it's the same things over and over. There's a sameness to it. The same things go wrong, and so uh, we started there and, and we built a a comprehensive workshop. Uh, that uh, prevents those things from happening. So uh, we give an installer the, 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 the basic skills and knowledge that they need to, uh, to, to maintain leak talk systems and, and, and keep problems from, from occurring. So we, we, t we follow the approach. We, of, we tell them the right way. We show them the right way. And then we put tools in their hands and, and we ask them to show us. And that's really where the, where the learning takes place. That's where the, 
where the teaching takes place uh, so that by the end of the class session, they have uh, demonstrated best practices. They've, they've demonstrated the right, right way to do it. So with this approach, um, we've built in metrics that include a written examination and also practical exams where they're actually building components. They're building sub components of a, of a, of a fluid system and we're verifying those and pressure testing them. So th they will receive not just a certificate of attendance, you know, they, uh, they get a certificate of completion after they've finished all the work. So Steve, in those early days when you went in and you did the safety seminars, and I think Logan and I kind of at the end of those were doing those, you know, you maybe have one person or two people volunteer to pull up a tube fitting, right? And then nowadays, do that. yeah, it varied, but yeah. And then now everybody has their own set of tools. Everybody has their own set of materials, all the, their own. It's really like going to a full fledged class, right? It is. It's a workshop. And we're not just asking for volunteers. Everybody is completing some, uh, you know, some, some preset work. Right. And so every person that comes through there uh, demonstrates uh, tubing prep, tubing handling, um, installation, not just on tubing fittings, but, but the other uh, types of end connections also. Well, that's great. So, Steve, we deal with a lot of different uh, customer bases and a lot of different industries, and we, we've talked about that on here before, but, uh, you know, the bottom line is every one of our customers does have somebody that's installing these fittings, that's, that's putting them together. Um, you know, one, one thing that we talk about with our customers a lot and one thing that, you know, I guess a question that we get asked is, you know, is training really necessary for these guys? Um, they've been doing it for a long time or can't they just learn through on the job training? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So on the job training is, is a part of everybody that I know, everybody's work experience, and it's a necessary, a valuable part of that. Um, and there, there are some jobs where you can step onto the job and just learn it as you go, you know, on the job training. But uh, uh, most jobs don't allow that. Most jobs have an element of risk or at least consequences, and you, you, you can't do it that way. And that's definitely the case when you're working with pressurized fluid systems in, in industry. Uh, it, it's... Uh, there's a lot of exposure there. We deal with hazardous media, you know, flammable gases and pyrophorics and caustics and acids and all, all the rest. And uh, aside from that, just the energy that's in a pressurized fluid system is, uh, is hazardous by itself. Unfortunately, we see injuries every year, you know, that range from minor to severe and even fatalities. And, uh, not to mention the, the problems associated with downtime and, and uh, uh, all that goes along with that. So, uh, you know, on the job training is going to happen and that's a good thing, but we need to start with a baseline of, of structured training where somebody is, is coached uh, in the right way to do it, using the components in the way that they were designed to be used. I'll put it this way. I, I wouldn't want somebody to do an appendectomy on somebody I care about, you know, who'd had on the job training alone. Uh, and I wouldn't want somebody uh, plumbing a, an acid line that, uh, huh, that, that they had learned on the job, especially if it was their first day. So, so Steve, with, with all that in mind, do you think peer to peer training is a good thing in that sense or? Yeah, I, you know, I think peer-to-peer uh, -peer training is not just a good thing. I think it's a necessary thing, uh, but we need to ask some questions about it. Uh, who's doing it? Who, who's leading the training? Is it, their, is it their designated role, or is it something that just fell to them uh, in, addition, in addition to what they normally do? Uh, are, they, are they good at it? You know, are they capable of training? There's a, there's a presumption out there that because somebody has a competency in a particular area that they're able to, uh, uh, you know, share that competency with somebody else. And that's, that's not always the case. Not everybody has the patience uh, for training, for teaching. And uh, uh, so 
that they say, it, you know, um, the, the best coaches were not the star players. They're the, the players that were marginal that had to really work and struggle uh, to make it. And they're the ones that are, uh, um, you know, the good, the good coaches, the good trainers. And so you can't just assume that anybody can do it. No. So, uh, uh, you know, the, the middle skills gap continues to, to grow. Um, we're in the middle of this massive turnover in the workforce. That's a long way from over, you know, that the, the, the exodus from the workforce started in, uh, 2011 and it's not going to uh, conclude until 2029. So we're right in the middle of it. And so all the more it's, it's, it's tougher to have a peer to peer, uh, training, uh, program because the, the age and experience is leaving at such a rapid rate. Hmm. Yeah. So, so I guess on that topic, there's, there's something called tribal knowledge. Um, you know, where information gets passed essentially from generation to generation. And, and we see that in the plants where, you know, some, somebody learned something from someone that taught them and then the new guys come in and they get taught that. What, what role do you think that this type of tribal knowledge plays in training? Well, I think it's important, uh, Logan. And, and I, I, if what you mean by tribal knowledge is that not everything is captured in a in an SOP or in an operations manual, there's there's things that are unique to every site uh, about their processes and about how they how they go about problem solving and and uh, the, the sorts of challenges that they face. And so um, that sort of information, that sort of knowledge, uh, needs to be uh, understood and communicated and passed along. Uh, it, and probably what happened within a training setting, whether that's formal. Uh, or informal, but we've got to be careful because um, there's a lot of myths and, and misconceptions that are uh, sort of wrapped up in that category. What are some of those myths that you mentioned or, or that come up with that? Yeah, um, you know, there, there's a couple of, of, of key ones that, that we see over and over. Uh, as long as I've been with Swayzok and before, and I, I know you guys have heard it also, and that is uh, when you're installing a tubing fitting, you insert the tubing into the fitting to make it up, that you should insert it all the way in and then back it off a little ways. And not only is that not helpful, that, that's 180 degrees wrong. And, it, and it, uh, it leads to leaks and potentially blowouts where the tubing actually blows out of the fitting under pressure, it's a catastrophic uh, failure there. The, the other one, that we hear, and, there, and there's more, but, but the other common one that we hear all the time is that when you're installing a tubing fitting, uh, you insert the tubing and then you just tighten the nut with a wrench until it feels right. You know, you just tighten it until, until it feels about right to you. And that is impossible because there's too many variables built into the tubing. There's the hardness uh, variable, there's the OD, uh, ID tolerance, the wall thickness tolerance, different materials. And so all of those variables uh, end up creating different torque values every time you make up a fitting. So every time you grab a fitting to, to tighten it up on a piece of tubing, tubing is going to be different in more or one ways and, uh, and the torque will be different. So you've got to tighten it according to geometry, not feel. Those are two that we just don't seem to want to go away. Uh, yeah, those myths are always fun and we we run into them on a daily basis and and you definitely do in your training classes and that's from people of all ages right that's right i've had the young guys tell me that oh you, i was told to back it out an eighth of an inch and i've had the old guys tell me too in the in the discussion like no you got to back it out an eighth of an inch and my understanding is that that came around from a, a welding procedure where you had to back it out an eighth of an inch to uh to have to do with the expansion of the tubing or the pipe as it was heating up. So that this has even no application to what we're talking about, but yet it's prevalent. So it's very prevalent. And, and that, as we've sat around uh, trying to theorize where that came from, that that's one of them, Buster. Uh, also, if you back it out, it makes it easier to disassemble the fitting. And I, I think that's another uh, possible source of that. And, and that's true but it also doesn't grip as well and doesn't seal as well and, and opens you up to all kinds of risk. All right. So, good practice. All right. So the bottom line is if you've been doing that, um, don't, 
and, and come to one of our training classes. That's right. Yeah. So in, in the new, I call it the, the new way, we, we've been doing it for this way for quite some time now, but you know, how's this, how's this new way of training impacted our customers? Yeah, you know, I would I would uh, answer that based on uh, the feedback that we regularly get when people come to uh, come through training, and uh, you know, I'm convinced that people want to do a good job. They they want to work safe. They want to uh, uh, be good at what they do. They want to take pride in their work. Uh, but uh, frequently, they feel that they haven't been equipped for it. They haven't had, you know, the prerequisite training they need to to be able. To do it, and so some of the things that I hear are, uh, I never knew that, and, and these are experienced hands saying this. I've I've heard them say I, I've been doing that wrong for 10, 15 years, and so uh, and I think that, wrong, probably. I'll say again, and they've probably been teaching that wrong also. That's right. That's right. Not only doing it wrong, but spreading it to other people. And once that gets ingrained, it's hard, it's harder to to break, harder to break a bad habit than it is to teach somebody the right way at the beginning. So I would say the impact uh, based on that is, is, is greater confidence. And, uh, and also it's measurable. So there, we, have, we can measure, you know, if there are fewer reworks and uh, elimination of leaks and that kind of thing. So, so we, can, we can measure to see if it's being effective or not. Yeah. Well, one of the other ways I see that it impacting our customers and just a quick story on this is that I know at one facility, we did an energy audit. We went out there, we checked their leaks. We came up with the figure of their leak rate. They're about 1.8%, which is a little high from a usual swage lock facility, not by much. Uh, so what we did, we sent a couple of their guys through training. We went in, trained them all, waited a year. They went through turnarounds. They went through um, new equipment, everything. Came back, went through the same facility area, tested it again, and then they were at like 0.8%. So they dropped a whole 1% of leak rate at that facility. When we're talking nitrogen, helium, plant air, plant gases, uh, it, it, hydrogen, anything that may be on there from a gas state that we check with that, to drop a whole 1% and put that into the cost of these gases, I mean, that's significant in our in my eyes. And when we talked about that to the customer, they they were even running some numbers that were had a couple had a comma in there so that they can say well, you know we're really saving it's not just the rework and the safety it's it's the total cost ownership of this so that, that's a perfect example get gas bottled gas is expensive that's a that's a good one yeah oh well, steve we we talk about two fitting training and two bending training for uh you know for the installers what, what other areas of training do we have? What other classes do we have? What other things do you train for? Yeah, that's a great question. We, we get asked that all the time. The, the, the core of what we do is, is safe installation and, and tube bending, like you've said. But uh, 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 there are a, there's a lot more to it than that. And so uh, one, of, one of the ones that's popular is safe valve selection. So if you've anybody that's ever looked through, uh, you know, the valve section of the Swage Lock catalog or, or any other vendors, valve catalog knows that there's a there's a there's a lot of different options out there there's a lot of different valve types and the the, the key to success really is, is to get the right valve in the right place and uh, we frequently ask you know when we go out to troubleshoot when we go out to service uh, an issue you know why did you put that valve in there and the questions we or rather the answer we get back is I don't really know or we get blank stares or you know, we needed a valve and we had this valve and so we put it in there. And so there's, there's a real lack of understanding. And so we, we have uh, this class that is designed to, to, to give that understanding and to give somebody the, the rationale they need for proper selection of a, of a valve. Uh, another one is, uh, is regulator safety. Regulators really are not very well understood and that can lead to a pretty unsafe situation. And so we, we teach a, a regulator safety class that uh, may range anywhere from two to four hours, depending on, you know, depending on the level of knowledge and depending on the objective uh, that particular site is trying to achieve. But we go into things like CGA fittings and understanding the different CGA fittings uh, that are appropriate for different uh, gas cylinders and also vent options 
and uh, just the functionality of a regulator to help somebody be able to understand it and, and work more safely with it. And one more, I'll give you one more that's, uh, that's, that's key, and that is threat identification. Um, there's a lot more thread standards out there than just MPT and SAE straight threads. Um, and we are in a global market, you know, here we are in Southeast Texas, but both of you know that in any plant that you may walk into, they may have equipment from anywhere in the world, uh, from Europe or from any part of Asia, Latin America. And that, that could be a lot of thread standards on there. And then they need to connect it or do maintenance on it. And if you put the wrong thread standard into the wrong port, you know what happens. Yeah. That, not only that does it right there is, is very beneficial. Uh, I know we've kind of gone through our ourselves, but when our customers call us out, they're like, hey, we just got this new piece of equipment in. It's all metric. We want to change it out to fractional, but we have some threads. We don't know what they are. Can you come out here? The ones who have gone through that training and done it, we don't hear those questions from us. We get deeper questions, but that, that one little piece right there is so easy for them to say like, oh, that's BSB, that's NPT, all that it really helps them out a lot. So, Yeah. And like everything else we address, this is all fixable. They just need a little coaching and training on how to use a digital caliper and a comb gauge and the charts. And they can, they can learn to identify thread standards and, and uh, save a lot of grief. Yeah. So right now, if you've been watching with us and following along, um, we've got a couple of questions come through Steve right now. So we would just want to go through there uh, answer a couple of those questions for the people watching today and and we'll go on that one. Logan, why don't you take the first one? All right, Steve, let's take a look here. Um, so this, this one came through a little bit earlier uh, from somebody listening. Um, what kind of training can we do right now during, during COVID and the work from home era? Yeah, that's a great question. And you, you guys both know we're, <clears throat> we're adapting it in all kinds of ways in the current environment. And so uh, we, will, we, we, we will always have as, as, you know, our core part of our foundation is to support and service our customers. And so we'll, we, we will have any conversation uh, about that to help them however we can. I will say that uh, really the value in the hands-on uh, workshop um, is, uh, is, is what it's all about. And so we cannot replicate that in a virtual environment, but as a, a temporary measure or to meet them where they are right now, or to set up something for later, we will, uh, we will do what we can to help them. Uh, and, and some of these other trainings, uh, like safe valve selection, we, we could do some of those things uh, a little easier in a virtual environment. Um, but uh, we're hoping to get back to face-to-face -face as quick as we can. So, Steve, what are, what are some of the kind of common misunderstandings about training that people believe? Yeah, there's <clears throat> there's a lot of things. I I think one of the one of the ones that that, that uh, comes up over and over is just that uh, training is not with fluid systems and fluid system components is just not necessary. I think in a lot of people's minds, it seems like such a simple thing. I mean, it's a tube fitting and the perception is, you know, you tighten it with a wrench, how, how much more complicated could it be? And so what do you need, 10, 15, 20 minutes to cover that? Uh, and that uh, misconception uh, uh, misses the fact that that that's just, you know, suede, there's suede like tubing fittings, but then there's tube adapters and plugs and caps and port connectors and threaded connections and tubing prep and tubing handling and all the rest. And, and uh, there's a lot more to it than uh, most people realize. We, we really barely scratch the surface in a four hour or an eight hour class. And so uh, nobody's born knowing how to do anything. Uh, they need to be uh, shown the right way. And, uh, I don't know if y'all read instructions or not, but most people don't read instructions. I don't. And so, uh, say that again. When I mess up on something, I go back and read. Yeah, we go back. And then, and then sometimes it's, it's too late. So um, we don't want that to happen. We want to make sure we're being proactive about it. And, and that's, what, that's what this can do for them. 
Another sure. question we have right now, Steve, is, um, is do you receive a certificate and how long is the training good for? Yeah, so we, th there is a certificate and it's not just a uh, participation ribbon, like we said earlier, no, it's, a, it's a certificate of completion and um, it, it is dated for two years from date of issue and uh, it does carry some uh, significance. There are uh, owner companies who write that specification into their construction uh, line items. And so um, oftentimes when somebody's going on site to do work, that cert is required. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. And uh, I guess this is looks like the last one here, but um, what didn't we talk about? What didn't we already cover that you think is important for people to know? I think we covered a lot of ground today, Logan. Um, but I would just say that uh, um, with with the the, the the consequences of of doing this wrong, just the the risk associated with pressurized fluid systems, whether they're hydraulic or pneumatic, and uh, combined with the pressure that the workforce is, is facing with the mass exodus of the, the baby boomers and, and all of that, we're kind of in, a, in the perfect storm here. And we, we uh, were convinced and, uh, that this is important. And we really feel that we want to do this, but we feel like we have to do this. We, we need to make this training available uh, to our customers uh, for everybody's safety and, and, and efficiency and, and all the rest. And so I can't emphasize enough how important uh, this is. Well, Steve, thank you for your time on this. There's a lot of great information. Uh, just, you know, we, we've kind of reached the end of our time limit and we want to be respectful of everyone. So just in a closing thought is what I take from this is that, you know, the significance of this training, we have electricians that we have to go through so much training and on the job training and classes training, continuing education because electricity can injure and kill someone. We have engineers that have to go through training that have to go through continuing education so that to make sure that they're up to date on everything going on. We have all these crafts in the field, chemists that, that go through all kind of significant training. When it comes down to the instrumentation side, uh, we feel it, I feel it's being marginalized to just come in and do a, a show and show us, you know, hey guys, slip a tube fitting in, tighten up the nut and mark the nut, and turn a quarter, and then everybody's trained and good. That we shouldn't be, the significance of this training should be taken more seriously and, and even on that same level because a hundred pound quarter inch uh, nitrogen line can do damage severely as much if not installed properly just as running a, a electrical cable can do and so for if you are listening and watching and and doing this think about that seriously a 100 pound psi line not installed properly what kind of damage that can do as compared to a, a 110 volt line ran and not grounded properly because the guy was trained on the job by someone who's been there so that's my thought let's get some yeah. good so that's, that's well said. That's really well said, Buster. And I'll, I'll just add to that. You, that that would be another misconception is that you have to be working with high pressure to, uh, you know, for it to really be a hazardous situation. And pressure is relative and it does not have to be 10,000 pounds. We have customers that work with 10, 20, 30 PSI, but you're right. It can be 100 to 200 PSI and still lead to a, a very unsafe situation where injuries happen. So, yeah. Very well put. Thank you. Logan? Those are, those are really good points. And, and I guess to kind of piggyback on, on what Buster said and Steve talked about a little bit, you know, tube, tube fittings are often not thought of until something, something happens or until the end of a project. And when the instrument lines are, are hooked up, that's, that's oftentimes the last thing that gets looked at. So the, the thing about it is you're not across the finish line yet. It's, it's just right before the finish line. So you, you want to finish strong. And we have run into situations in the past where you know, customers might come to us after something has happened and they want to get everybody trained up because they did have um, 
unfortunately something happened to, to one of their lines and obviously we're happy to go in and train at, at any time but there's there's some merit to being proactive in something like this versus reactive after something happens um, and and when you're proactive about it you know you, you might not have those issues hopefully you won't that that you could have otherwise so that's that's why we're out there you know Buster Steve and I and, and all of our other technical advisors are out there talking about training all the time and um, Steve we really appreciate you uh, coming in and, and sharing some of your knowledge with us and if you haven't been to one of Steve's training classes, please reach out to any of us and we will we will get you set up. So thanks a lot, Steve. You're welcome. Thank you guys. Um, so on the next episode, we have we're gonna have Nathan Perkins with us. And and Nathan Perkins is our field service guy. So what is Swage Lock doing with field services? Well, tune in next week, 9 a.m. and every Wednesday at 9 a.m. to find out. Buster. So thanks, guys, everyone, for watching, for tuning in, for listening. Uh, we do have some great things coming up, like Logan said. To be aware of this, go to sset.swagelog.com. You can sign up for our newsletter where we put out a lot of our information on what's coming up, new advances, training, things like that. You can also find out more training by going to our website of sset.swagelog.com. And as always, you can follow us on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and on Instagram. Just look up Swagelock Southeast Texas, and we're there. You can contact us through there. We have a little bit more fun on our Instagram and Facebook on things. Uh, LinkedIn, we're always publishing new information that's coming out. Great way to get a hold of us. And as always, we will see you all next week, 9 a.m., Nathan Perkins. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for your time. If you do have a suggestion for the show, let us know, and we'd be glad to put that on here. Thanks, guys. Have a great week. Have a great week.